Today on Sagittarian Matters, we talk about 90s hardcore bands, elderly sourdough, microwaved lettuce, vim and vigor, and so much more. As friends of the show Morgan and I have a five-course vegan dinner with Don Riddle at Bad Boys Diner. Stay tuned. Sagittarian Matters, Sagittarian Matters, what's the Hello from the Sagittarian Matters Social Distancing Studios in Portland, Oregon. Listeners, hello from a young woman who lives her life like Lou Sedaris chewing on an old banana peel. It is me. I am somebody who just completely remade a dessert that turned out wrong by melting all the same elements from the dessert and trying again. But before I get to that... I want to give you a little bit of expectation management for what is going to happen today before we get to our main course, which is Dinner with Don Riddle at Bad Boys Diner featuring friend to the show Morgan. Before that, I want to talk about the dessert. I want to tell you about some events I have coming up, a calendar opportunity, some teaching stuff, and then we'll talk about today's episode. Okay, let's take it away. If you read my graphic memoir, Calling Dr. Laura, you will remember that in the very beginning, I make chocolate peanut butter cups out of the vegan cookbook, How It All Began. I know it's controversial because I besmirched their good name in the book. It's true. Some of the measurement conversions I feel got messed up from Canadian to US. That's my guess. But some of the recipes in there were a home run, chocolate peanut butter cups being one of them. The gist of the recipe is you melt a bunch of peanut butter in a pot with a bunch of vegan butter or oil of your choice. You add some sugar um, and you add some graham cracker crumbs. You put that mixture, that like chunky molten peanut butter mixture in some muffin cups or muffin tins. And then you melt some chocolate chips with soy milk or almond milk or whatever. And then you pour your chocolate chip situation into the center of those peanut butter cups, which like make way for the molten chocolate. The molten peanut butter makes way for the molten chocolate. It's basically like a liquidy affair. And then you stick it in your fridge or freezer. I put it in the freezer because I have uh, low ability to wait for things. And then it kind of hardens up and you have this kind of greasy, crunchy, salty, sweet treat that is very decadent. It's a delight. Um, I've been hauling around this ancient copy. Uh, is it 20 years old? Probably. This ancient copy of How It All Began for a trillion years. It is like disgusting. It's bursting at the seams with recipes. If you ever want to make have me make a recipe zine, please let me know. Please like comment on the Sagittarius Matters Facebook page or like become a Patreon and, you know, I don't know, send me a DM or something. Uh, anyway, I have a billion recipes I've made up probably none of them, which is why I never have done a cooking zine because it feels like I'm just ripping off 15 different people. Be that as it may, I was looking for this recipe online because I decided on my most recent voyage between Portland and Los Angeles that I wasn't going to bring this you know, ancient testament to vegan cooking from the late 90s with me. By the way, I first bought that cookbook as a zine out of the back of a car from a hardcore guy in the band Trial, who I think was married to Sarah Kramer, who is the co-writer of that book. And I was like, how it all vegan? This doesn't make any sense. And it took me like five years to realize it's called how it all began. Not unlike when I learned the word zine and I thought it was zine until I went to a show to sell my zine with other zinesters and I heard them say, I heard them here, they gave me their pamphlet and I was like, I do a zine too. Oh. Ugh, am I still embarrassed? Not at all. How was I supposed to know? I was living in the suburbs of Kansas and I didn't know. Anyway, I can tell you the story about how I learned about zines another time. Perhaps in my class at the Fine Arts Work Center coming up in December. More about that later. Okay, so I was trying to look up this recipe and I just want you to know, because this is old news and I don't know how to besmirch women on the internet without feeling like I'm um, a tool of the man and sticking up peg in the heart of feminism that but I'll say it on the podcast apparently the website oh she glows 
had essentially this recipe and then, but it didn't say it was this recipe. It said it was ripped off from some other website called like the kindest kitchen. And then in the comments, somebody said, Hey, this is the exact recipe from how it all began page 145 or whatever page it was. And then the Oh, she glows person was like, no, it's not. It's adapted from the kindest kitchen, just straight faced, complete denial, no recognition that she fucking jacked this weird recipe. This is a weird recipe. It's not a normal recipe. It's like you have molten peanut butter. You have molten chocolate. It's like too oily. It's too salty. It's odd. It's not something that everyone's just going to make up. Like it doesn't taste like a peanut butter cup, like a Reese's peanut butter cup. It doesn't taste like candy. It tastes like an oily ass mess. And this person ripped off this recipe and just like not even the recognition like, oh, maybe they got it from Sarah Kramer. Just like, uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, commenter, this is from this thing. You may ask yourself, Nicole, why are you telling us on the podcast instead of just commenting on this thread? Because the last comment was seven years old. I found this by Googling, uh, you know, chocolate peanut butter cups, quote, how it all began. And I found this because the person in the comments had been like, this is the exact recipe from a cookbook that came out in the year 2001. Anyway, so I didn't look at that. I looked further and then I found this like Jewish vegetarian website that was like, here's the recipe from how it all began. But guess what? They adjusted something or other. And this, basically I had to find the recipe online. Somebody adjusted it in the retelling. I was making this recipe. The peanut butter turned into just a hot wad. Uh, the chocolate chips and almond milk turned into a hot wad. And so then I just had this like gross clump of peanut butter with a gross clump of chocolate on top of it. it may sound great to you. It wasn't great. So I tried to feed it to my spouse. It didn't work. It just didn't work. It just came right back out of her mouth. Same for myself. So today I took them apart and then I re-melted everything, adding more of the things I thought it needed, more oil, more milk, more sugar, more stuff. And then I just poured them back into the muffin, t- muffin tins and put them back in the freezer. Would I ever do this if I was serving you a dessert? Would I be manhandling it, ripping it apart with my bare hands, stirring it like a cavewoman and putting it back together? No, I would not. Would I do this for myself? I would. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about chocolate peanut butter cups from how it all began. Uh, Once I'm reunited with the cookbook, I'm happy to show you the recipe. Listen, I'm doing a few events this month. I'm doing two events this month. I have a calendar coming out and teaching a class. Here's the events. September 15th, I will be in conversation via Zoom via at, at Powell's with Eleanor Whitney about her new book, Riot Woman. You can find more details at powells.com. I will also be posting about this on Instagram. On September 22nd, I will be in a panel conversation uh, through Literary Arts on Zoom, again, called Creating the Graphic Novel, Inception to Publication with Jonathan Hill, Barry Deutsch, M.K. Reed, and Aaron Nels Steinke. That's September 22nd at 7 p.m. This is in honor of literary arts saying, hey, graphic novelists, please submit your graphic novels for the Oregon Book Awards. I won two Oregon Book Awards for Fetch, and it was the highlight of my career. It was one of the highlights of my career. It was really nice. Um, And so I am being asked to try and tell other cartoonists, hey, Submit your work to literary arts because this is the year when they're judging graphic novels along with other normal literature. You know what I mean. Okay. The other things I want to tell you are I'm making an anonymous fuzzball calendar. Look, I don't, you do the math. I stopped, I made a calendar for like 10 years and then in 2016, I decided I want to take a break. Guess what happened in 2016? The fucking end of the world started. Okay. Well, don't worry, I'm back. I'm putting out another calendar. I'm not saying it's going to fix the world, but I'm not saying it's not. Um, you, don't have, you don't have to buy my calendar. But look, anonymous fuzzball, full color, the animals you love, 12 of them for the year, a couple more that I could throw in on the back cover. Um, it should be out in October, I think. But here's the deal. It's going to be limited edition because I have limited patience. And so I'm going to offer it to Patreon patrons first. I'm going to post on there first, post a link to them first, let them order it first. And Ponyo's Friend Club members get one copy 
for free, not for free, just as a benefit of being a Ponyos Friend Club member. So if you want to know about it first, please make haste to Patreon. You can become a patron for as little as $2 a month, which is, you know, pocket change. And uh, that's like a, that's like a fraction of a service fee for using your debit card at a coffee shop. Um, anyway, I'm making a calendar. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. I, I, I wanted to wait till I had my renewed vim and vigor for it, and I do. The last thing I want to tell you is I'm teaching an online graphic memoir workshop with the Fine Arts Work Center in Providence, Rhode Island. But again, this is via Zoom, December 6th through 10th, that week. Five days a week, two hours a day. Let's be honest, I like to go over two and a half to three hours a day, if you can make it. If you can't make it, you can always watch the recording later. Um, If you would like to do drawing and writing exercises with me and producer Ponyo, and have me tell you things about your work or my opinions of your work, generally supportive, please do sign up. Um, I would love to draw with you and read your work. You can find out more through a link on my Instagram page or go to fawc.org, fineartsworkcenter.org. You do not need drawing experience to come. All you have to do is want to draw for five days a week and want to be in a tiny community of other people that are drawing for five days a week. And that's it. It's kind of sweet. It's kind of celebratory. It's kind of good vibes. And um, don't hold it against me that I use the word vibes. I do live on the West Coast. A short time ago, friend to the show Morgan and I were invited over to Bad Boys Diner for a fully vegan five course meal made up of entirely original recipes. Bad Boys Diner is a free dining experience created by Portland artist, musician, and playwright Don Riddle. If listening to a podcast is like hanging out with the host, then this episode might be like attending a dinner party with friends. I invite you, listeners, to a Northeast Portland backyard at the end of the summer with producer Ponyo, friend to the show Morgan, myself, and Don Riddle. We'll talk about the sourest sourdough focaccia, hardcore music from my past that does not hold up, making the best out of food fails, microwaving lettuce, a mild tahini milkshake recipe, and more. If you would like to see some of Dawn's culinary creations, go to Bad Boys Diner on Instagram, or just email her from there and she'll give you the recipe to anything you hear about on the show. Now, dine with us, won't you? Morgan, what do you see here today? We're going to start end to end. I am staring at the most handsome tomato pie. It's like a fluffy focaccia with cherry tomatoes. And then if you look to your right, you can see the source of the cherry tomatoes. They're right behind you, Nicole. Okay, we got a fresh cherry tomato tomato pie. We've got a composed salad with like green beans, green peas, sauerkraut, cucumbers, radicchio. We've got a flourishy lettuce, a curly green, and sliced carrots with mini tongs and dressing on this side. There's like tofu cutlets with garbanzo beans that look all seasoned with some kind of a tomato chutney and a green sauce. Oh, that was Pano. And then there's some kind of cake with a yellow glaze and beautifully perched blackberries in concentric circles. Wow. And two bottles of wine? So Don Riddle has uh, promised us today that these are all original recipes. Mm -hmm. Original recipes. Are there any other themes? No. Uh, the, some of the stuff, the green beans and the sugar snap peas, and obviously the tomatoes are from my garden. Obviously. The focaccia is sourdough. Mm. It's from a 100-year-old sourdough starter that someone gave me. So it's a, it's a, a senior citizen. Okay. Uh, and then this is, remember uh, sesame crunch cake? Yeah. That's my new base <laughs> recipe. I am not vegan, gluten-free, sugar-free, any of those things. Yet my go-to cake right now is a vegan, non-processed sugar, gluten-free cake. Um, I'd like to mention one other item. Yeah. Uh, it's in that Tupperware over there. Sludge cake! It's a sludge cake. So the other day I made horchata and I got really free with it and I had rice, some hemp hearts or hemp seed hearts, whatever yeah. those are called, and um, almonds. That was the base. Yeah. And then... You know, you blend it up and run it through a strainer or a nut milk bag. Mm -hmm. and then there was like a bunch of dregs. So I just threw them in there into the base in cake recipe, which is different every time. And now um, is 0% measuring. 
Okay. All eyeballing. 100% eyeballing. Yeah. I don't think anything here had measurement. Except for um, I weighed the salt. That's oh incredible. My God, that's perfect. Intuitive baking. Into it. All right. Well, let's let's get into it. <laughs> I want to talk about a salad, but I also want to talk about Don's idea of what is a salad. Oh, what isn't a salad? Oh. What is a salad? Oh. Fuck. I mean, anything that's like chopped up vegetables is a salad, I think. But also, if you're vegan, isn't everything a salad? Isn't it? I think we're only eating salad here. This is a salad. It's a salad. I mean, it does have an entire zucchini in it. They're talking about the cake again. <laughs> yeah. It's a salad. Uh, and it's a salad, actually. Mm. Um, so we have bread salad, salad salad, mm. protein salad, and a cake salad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing I really like with salads, which I think makes them pop, is a cooked thing in the salad. So we have blanched. Ponyo agrees. Ponyo, where are you at? Under the table. Oh. Agreeing uh, with you. We have blanched green bean in there. That's the cooked part. Mm. And then I like sour things. So we have some sauerkraut and some olives. And uh, readers, please write in and say how you say the name of Castavastrano, Castavastrano, Castavastrano. I don't know. We don't know. All right. So I'm going to tell you that's really the salad. And I like a kind of Nassau, like deconstructed salad. Uh And then because then you just get to make your own decisions. I like this. Morgan, you're a fan of salads. What is a salad or what isn't a salad? I'm in the camp of what isn't a salad. I mean, I require a green and anything alongside that to me is a salad. Breakfast salad, lunch salad, dinner salad, snack salad. Dare I say a dessert salad? Oh, that's peaceful. That's what this is. This is a dessert salad, you know? And I am partial to romaine. That's just me. It's not the only criteria, but it sure does. (laughs) Does it feel scandalous after the romaine um, scare of a couple years ago? There was a ton of them, right up one right after the other. Yeah. I know. I'm so committed. I just keep coming back. It's I, I just can't quit romaine. I, I just can't. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but my mom eats mm. an entire head of romaine lettuce every day for lunch. That's like me. With her hands. Tears it? If it's too cold, she sometimes microwaves it for like eight seconds. What are you talking about? I love to make the lettuce room temperature. If it comes right out of the fridge and Uh it maybe would hurt her teeth. Hmm. Sometimes we go on a walk and she puts it into a fanny pack so that while we walk, she can reach into the fanny pack and eat the lettuce. No dunking? Oh no 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 topping whatsoever. My mom loves flavors and loves tastes, but they're not requisite to her meals. And she does not care about cooking at all. Wow. Does not want to do it. And so she often will just eat a piece of sliced bread. Yeah. Um, an entire bowl of steamed squash. I don't even think there's salt on the squash. Ooh, wow. Um, just lettuce. Um, Did your whole life? Yes. Wow. I'm really loving this lettuce revelation because I definitely during most times of the year could just polish off a head of lettuce a day. They take up a lot of room in the fridge is the problem. So you Mm kind of have to have this like rotation when we were growing and it was really great. You just walk outside, you got a head of lettuce. And I'm convinced that between the dressing I make by the pint and the romaine lettuce, specifically romaine, others are welcome. It gives me vim and vigor. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced. Just pep in my step every dang day. I can't. I, I start to get weird when I don't have it. I'm going to try it. I could eat. Bird oh. friend. There's a woodpecker cameo. Oh, my God. There's a woodpecker here. I could eat a whole. I mean, I could eat a whole head of kale every day. That's no problem for me. No way. Cooked or a salad or whatever. But I've never tried just doing. Sa- I mean, sometimes I've been like, we're going to eat salad every day. And it'll take two days. Mm-hmm. No and then way. I'll fall off. You got to put more stuff on it. Put every single thing. Like put pizza chopped up on your salad. Oh. I really think the way you eat salad constantly is you just like every day or two, you make a gigantic salad and you leave out the wet things like cucumbers. I like to do lettuce, cabbage, a chicory, shredded carrots. Mm, right. Put like a ton. Put it yeah. in a big Tupperware. And then it's breakfast time. You're going to have a tofu scramble. You just put, it put on your the... claw hand into that Tupperware, slap it on your plate. You're having salad for breakfast. Didn't have to think about it. Maybe you want to put a lot of toppings on it for dinner then you have the base Mm -hmm. so versatile you're like a living salad bar you're like sizzler so um i have a lot of tomatoes growing i bought four tomato plants this is my first year having a garden and i was like tomatoes i love them i don't want to buy them i want to grow them and so i bought 
four tomato plants and then um, no less than 70 just planted themselves. Oh. Mm. And for months, I dug them up, potted them, and put them out uh, in front of my house and people took them. Great. Uh, and now I'm down to about 15 okay. <laughs> tomato plants and they are producing. Uh, and so a lot of this dinner has to do with I'm overwhelmed. Let's, so let's go one tomato at a time. Oh, okay, so this is a sun gold. Um, no, so I made my favorite way to deal with tomatoes. I say it's a tomato confit. Yeah. Okay, but I don't know. I think that just means you cook something kind of low and slow in its own juices. Mm. Right? I'm fairly sure that's what that means. Sounds good. But I'm a bad boy, so I don't care. Mm -hmm. I like that. You play by your own rules. No rules whatsoever. Okay. Mm. Except for a, a couple. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like tomatoes, you cut them up, different kinds. Add a little balsamic vinegar, a lot of olive oil, salt. Uh, every herb you have, I have like a cool little herb garden. Love it. Beautiful. And uh, onions and garlic, you don't have to chop it real because it cooks so long that it like liquefies All everything. Right. Okay. And then um, you put it, I cook it in a Dutch oven at 300 for three hours. <laughs> All right, Whoa. Morgan, you and I need to try this wow. tomato confit with chickpeas. Okay. Yeah, have it with some chickpeas. Can we include the chickpeas in Whatever this? Whatever you want. My okay. God, I love a chickpea. What do you see, Morgan? What are you trying? <laughs> There's this, what's this sprinkle on top of the chickpea? Uh, Aleppo pepper. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sweet, savory, refreshing, but also depth of flavor. That tomato confit is really something. That is I feel a, like we're unchopped. <gasps> that tomato confit is really something. Throwing it on the ground, why not? I, I had an herb stem that oh, I had to throw out of my mouth. Chef mm. Don, I'm getting ah. um, the sweetness of the tomato. I'm getting the richness, I'm getting the herb infusion, mm. and they're pairing so nicely with the, the cool, the chilled chickpea. Mm. Today's episode is brought to you by Maria Turner Carney, Laura Perry, Emily Helmus, Lily Withicombe, Cancerian, Shoshana Ruth Wechter, and Joey Soloway. If you would like to support Sagittarian Matters, in particular, producer Chris Sutton, please send $5, $5 million via PayPal to hornetleg at gmail.com. Or this just in, he's got a Venmo, Hell Books on Venmo. That's H-E, double hockey sticks, books. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to saying your name on the podcast. Producer Ponyo looks forward to it too. Don't be scared. That's just Ponyo's speaking voice. So, Morgan, I just let you listen to a band I loved in high school. <laughs> the band is called Boy Sets Fire. It was a hardcore band. Uh, you're not going to believe it. It was men, I think. <laughs> mm. uh, men in a hardcore band? I know. What year was this? <laughs> you're not going to believe it, but it was the 90s. <laughs> it was a hardcore band comprised of male musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to make a I think they were a bunch of white guys. <laughs> I think. I, my, my, I don't, I saw I don't them. know. I went to their concerts. I went to their concerts. I loved them. I cried. I scream mm. cried singing along. Um, rocked with the whole, you know, like like literally rocking where everyone is like doing like the hard work, people holding their heads rocking. But there was like a part that was going to really cut in when you go like point your finger. You point your oh, finger. Oh, yeah. That's the part. <laughs> we all know it. <laughs> but so, I, I, you know, there's different hardcore bands or bands I liked as a youth, youth? that I have come back to and been like how do they hold up like ink and dagger same era held up for me i'm not listening to them right now but it was vampire hardcore from what? philadelphia yep. known yeah. known drug addicts who would do things like pee in your shampoo when they stayed at your house when wow, they were guys. on tour and you said yes you can sleep at my house party of five they would do <laughs> things like play mean pranks on you Thank you for letting us stay at your house. I peed in your shampoo. It's a vampire for you. That's <laughs> a vampire for you. Vampires are always peeing wherever they want. <laughs> that's something that's not mentioned in the Twilight movies. And in, um, it's heavily explored in uh, Dracula, though. Hmm. <laughs> Bram Stoker really yeah. was like, I was like, another chapter on the urinary habits of Dracula's <laughs> vampires. But so what did you think of Boy Sets Fire, <laughs> the music? Well, I just played you a little bit of the music via my phone speaker from Spotify. Oh, wow, I didn't know <laughs> there could be so much wah-wah pedal in one song. <laughs> it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. And then just like the grinding, you know, grainy guitar and then a sad, angry 
boy voice. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hear what they were singing about, but Nicole did show me that the uh, well, some of album short. art was a fetus. The lyrics are like, I am no one, I am nothing. <laughs> point, point, point. That's yeah, the one. That's hardcore. <laughs> and I've long been vexed by the chorus to that song, which is Dignity is for the Weak, which he repeats over and over again until he's singing it. And I remember even at the time being like scratching my head a little bit, but just <laughs> everyone was pointing then. Like, so you just start pointing. Yeah, and then you're like, pointing. what does that mean? <laughs> was it sort of like the meek will inherit the earth? I, I don't know. I mean, I hate to be baffled by this at, you know, <laughs> 20 something years later, but I'm still like, like, did he write that lyric? And everyone in the band was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone was like, whoa. It's like high school poetry. It's like yeah, high school poetry. This like, podcast is just being confused by songs now. These are all songs <laughs> that I've been confused by things I have a problem with. Um, for the record, I have seen that band play and heard their music, and what you played me was like, I I completely <laughs> erased what that sound was like, and then I was like, uh, this is a sound, I guess. I don't the magic of the need brain. to hear it again. Thank you for forgetting. Until- wait, wait till you hear it on some killer speakers. Yeah, oh, I probably really do need point, the- point. I need the subwoofers. <laughs> I mean, I just and those tweeters so I could get all the emotional energy. I have one more thing to say about it, which, gosh, I just want everyone to know that it does seem like their most recent album is from, I don't know if you want to guess, but their most recent album... 2013. 17. 2017. 2019. 2019. They probably would have been touring if it weren't for the pandemic. Oh my gosh. Can you guys go to see them on tour? What are you eating? Wow. This is a baked slab of tofu, a tofu steak. Oh. With a green sauce that looks kind of creamy, but not creamy, creamy. You know what I mean? Emulsified. And it's, um, hold on. Baked, still tender inside. Tart, lemony, garlicky, very fresh and herbaceous. Mm. Don, I think you have something to say about this wow. green sauce. Is it a pesto? Well, I have something to say about that and the tofu. Okay. Mm. I have a, what I would describe as, uh, for, for my non-vegan existence, as an egg practice, mm-hmm. where I have very specific ways about making eggs. But we're not talking about eggs on this vegan podcast. No way. We're talking about no. tofus. So I am a strong believer in really long process cooking that doesn't involve a lot of hands-on, but involves a lot of, like, routine. So here's what you do with the tofu. You, well, get, yeah. you get the tofu. You open it up and you take all the waters out. Then you wrap it in a dish towel and you put it in your fridge for, let's say, up to two days. Mm -hmm. But probably, hopefully one day. And then you make any type of marinade. And I like to put some water in that marinade. Mm -hmm. And then the tofu sponges up the marinade. You just leave it there for up to a day. Just in your fridge. Yeah. And then you bake it at 420 degrees. Cool. That's why I bake things. That's what the bread and the tofu were in the oven at the same time. A 420 feast. And uh, I just think it gives the tofu a really great skin. Mm-hmm. Like I like a, a, a skin on the outside and a soft on the inside. And then I, I often don't season it that much. And then I use it to like cut it up and put it in stir fries for like added flavors. So you're oh. getting it at a pretty like it's neutral level. Mm-hmm. And then the pesto, I really took the microphone. I'm really talking so much. So the pesto is uh, some cilantro that I was scared was going to go bad and some parsley and a bunch of great northern beans because that makes a creamy vegan pesto. Instead of nuts? Instead of nuts. And then there's like garlic and lemon and stuff. It's so good. This could also be called the poor man's pesto. Nicole said this is called poor man's pesto. It's a rich man's pesto. The taste is rich, but you don't have to. It's not going to break the bank. Bad Boys Diner is a 100% free establishment who uh, is not supportive of capitalism and uh, rich man's pesto will not be tolerated here. Oh, I see, I see. Well, this is a very delicious pesto, but if you don't want to buy nuts, you can use beans in your pesto. And it's so creamy and delicious. This would hug a pasta like nothing else. Just a, a gentle embrace. Uh, uh, I did have a for-profit day at your yard sale. You mm. did. Mild milkshake. Mm-hmm. What's a mild milkshake? Okay, mild milkshake is... Gosh, I haven't made it in a while. Since the garage sale. So if I'm making it for one, yeah, it's one date, mm-hmm. half a frozen banana, a tablespoon of tahini, a tablespoon of carob powder, mm-hmm. a generous 
pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. Water, like maybe a quarter cup. Mm -hmm. And um, four ice cubes. Mm. Maybe a third of a cup of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I put like hemp hearts in there. Mm -hmm. I bought them once and I'm never going to use them all. I don't really know what their deal is, but... I've had that experience. I had to throw them away after maybe four years of I having keep them. keep them in the fridge, and then they'll mm -hmm. last a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mild milkshake. They were great. They were quenching, even in the rainstorm that <laughs> quenched her. Is that what happened? I saw it because it was like six rains. <laughs> yeah. Six rounds of rain, and we tried to cover everything. You know what? It was for a fundraiser. People still bought some damp items, oh, and good. the mild milkshakes were a wild success. We have this one guy who kept coming back to the yard sale, a really cool like older man in a truck or a van. Bought a lot of like drum gear. He bought like three milkshakes. Really? Yeah, like, he was... maybe even a muffin or something. Yeah, but he like really liked the milkshakes. He came back for a second milkshake and then hung out. Just mm -hmm. hung out. It was great. That's... Today's episode is brought to you by Lagusta's Luscious Chocolates. Organic, fair trade, always vegan caramels, bonbons, bars, and more. Made for you in New Paltz, New York with passion and politics. Use the code Sagittarian for 10% off your order at lagustasluscious.com. S-A-G-I-T-T-A-R-I-A-N. And hey, if you're feeling the fall spirit, try their Caramel and Autumn Leaves box filled with apple caramels, maple pecan caramels, and delicious chocolate painted leaves with vegan maple cream. Follow them on Instagram at Lagusta's Luscious for secret sales and behind the scenes candy making, including a candy skull filled with more candy. Side note, I want to take a moment and tell you that when I lived in the middle of nowhere, I signed up to receive Lagusta's chocolates once a month through the Chocolate of the Month Club, and it was the highlight of my entire life. Anyway, 10% off your order at lagustasluscious.com with the offer code Sagittarian. Morgan, what are you eating right now? I've got confit on pie, and it is tomato on tomato glory. This is mm, the I gotta go. ancient sourdough. <laughs> the ancient sourdough focaccia, like, pizza. It's an antique. Pizza pie, 100-year-old. Mm -hmm. Where did you get this 100-year-old sourdough? My friend, Paul's coworker, gave it to him. Thanks, Paul's coworker. There's herbs inside of this bread. There I are. see them inside. This Rosemary's. is beautiful. Mm. It's delicious. It's tender. Like it's it's like chewy. This is the most sour homemade bread I've ever had done. Whoa. Yeah. Good job. I made this the first time mm. when I was trying to just make a loaf of bread, and then I kind of forgot about it. And I was like, I mean, if you've ever made sourdough, there's so many steps. It's so, it's such a freaking process. Mm -hmm. And I forgot and got lazy. And so I was like, I'll just smash it down and bake it like focaccia. And it was really good. So then I started making it more focaccia-y, which basically just means I add olive oil to the dough and slightly more salt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I know like mm. the base measurements for the flours, but I'm always putting like different flours. And I, I really don't, I really think that bread uh, does not necessitate uh, preciousness. You just, mm. you like if you make bread enough, you're just kind of like gonna make some bread. Mm -hmm. You know what the the feeling should be of the dough. Feeling. But the th cool thing about this is, I for those of you who make sourdough, you like you make a levan and then you like mix it and then you do this like, uh, and then you 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 add the salt and then you do these like long hour long process of like folding it over on itself and then usually you put it in the fridge this one you don't put it in the fridge you like fold it a couple times you leave it out all day and then you bake it mm. Mm. it's sour it's perfectly salty the tomatoes on top are delicious the mm -hmm. herbs are wonderful it's got a nice crust this is a dream it is a dream did you paint it with a tomato paint i mean well so i made a different comfy and then mm. i just immersion blended it and then I painted it on with a spoon and then I just cut some tomatoes in half and pushed them in there. It's delightful. If you guys want the recipe for anything, mm -hmm. donriddle at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Send me an email. Yeah. I'll send you the recipe. Oh my God. Will Generous. it be precise? No. You've got to trust yourself. And Ooh. maybe it's going to come out bad. Then you'll have learned. 
Then you'll learn what, what's bad about it. Okay, too much salt. Well, now you know. Yeah. Next time. That's my favorite way of cooking. I've been preaching forever. Let's not be so prescriptive. Let's get descriptive with our cooking. Whatever. Mm-hmm. So it turns out bad. People are so afraid of bad cooking results. But like, yeah, it's definitely going to be bad. Even like skilled chefs have bad cooking and it's still food. It's fine. You can mostly eat it, mm-hmm. especially if it's vegan. Well, I just, I also think like, okay, so in art, you it's know, I was just, forward. just railing on the podcast again about not throwing away drawings. If you fuck it up as you go, just keep going. Mm-hmm. But I feel that way about food too. Like mm-hmm. if something's too salty, okay, what can you pair it with? What can it turn into? Mm-hmm. You know, like this sourdough, you're like, I don't want to wait for that to be a sourdough. I'm a, it's, it's focaccia now. Like, I feel yeah. like there's so many foods that's like, maybe it wasn't the thing you were aiming for, but what is it? Yeah. And how can you work with that or add other things to make it something good? Yeah. And bread is such a good one for that because you dry it out, make breadcrumbs, make Yum. croutons. Yum. Use it to like thicken Crostini. a soup. Thicken a damn soup. What's that salad called? Pan- panzanella. panzanella. Make it panzanella. That's mm-hmm. a good salad. Chop That's a great a example of how free you can get with salads. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is an expansive cooking experience. Wow. This expansion has been so delicious. And sometimes you discover new stuff. Mm-hmm. I made this thing called Shapes and Peas for a long time that was so good. Excuse me? What's that? What was that? Excuse me? Uh-huh. It was just soaked, yeah, hold on to this. soaked millet for way too long. Uh huh. Because you forgot about it? Well, I'd be like, <laughs> I'm just uh, trying something. And then I'd be like, well, I feel sketchy about this. I'm going to rinse it, but I'm still going to leave it soaking. So for some days, as many days as you feel good about, and then you cook it up like a polenta, let it set oh. up, cut the most, you know, freeform shapes you can possibly chop, more surface area, fry them up, put some frozen peas or fresh peas on there, season mm-hmm. with whatever. It's so good. Millet, you know, like polenta, I guess, if you will, but accidents lead to good stuff. Yeah. Sometimes. John Riddle, recently on the podcast, I talked about something that's plagued me for years, which is the plot of the song, Wake Up Little Susie. In the, movie, in the song, the movie wasn't so hot. They fell asleep. Now, they were supposed to be home at 10, but now it's 4 o'clock in the morning. What? They're worried about their reputations. I, and how do they sleep till 4 o'clock in the morning? These were my questions. I think you may have cracked the case via your neighbor. So, I was mentioning that I was going to have you over for dinner, and it was gonna, we were going to do some recording for the podcast. And then Aaron said, oh, Nicole has a podcast that's not... Um, Relative fiction? Relative fiction. I was like, Stranger Than Fiction, that bad religion album that you wrote. Um, And uh, I said, yeah, it's called Sagittarian Matters. And then she was like, okay, I'll listen to it. And then she came, I was downstairs doing laundry. We live in the same building. She came downstairs and she was like, I listened to like five minutes of that podcast and I got something to say. And I was like, (laughs) okay, yeah. And she was like, Wake Up Little Susie makes perfect sense. They were at a drive-in movie. And they that's where all the teens go in oldies. It's always drive-in. Did they, she actually said, did they even have movie theaters then? Great question. And she says they fell asleep in their car. Everyone thought they were having sex because they were all there. They all saw that their car didn't leave the drive-in. I see. And that is also how like an usher didn't kick them out. But really, like the people—they're outside. This is—I feel like that drive-in thing. She cracked the case wide open for me. It, it's so much more plausible that she's a professional investigator. She is. Yeah, that's her job. Well, so no wonder she just cracked this case wide open. That's yeah. her. That's her job. That's her job. She's a regular old Hercule Poirot. I don't know who that is, but I really, I really <laughs> appreciate that. It's Agatha Christie. Oh, I see. I see. It's beautiful. But I. I mean, I, part of me is still like, how common of an experience is that, that, that they're going to write a song and everyone's going to be like, I can relate. Sagittarian Matters is produced by Chris Sutton, with assistance by Panyo Georges. Our theme music is composed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs of the band Bouquet. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.